I'm going to start with the two pieces of advice I have gone to the habit of giving. Name, if you want to do well on this exam, what should you do? You should do problems. Don't just watch problems. Don't just read problems. Actually do problems. Get stuck. Bang your head against the, the desk or wall or wherever you, you have a head banging device nearby. You know, think about what's happening. Because you need to figure out where are you not understanding. And then you need to figure out how do I start to understand. And so the, the act of doing math will help you to be better at doing math. So do problems. We're going to do problems today. There's a full review that we did last semester that you can access from start to finish. It's all there. And there's lots of other problems that are available. The other thing I say, take care of your health. This means eat food, get sleep. It's a very bold move to fall asleep in the middle of the exam. <laughs> Students have done it. Don't recommend it. So, you know, take care of yourself. And that also includes mental health. Don't stress yourself out too much. Yes, I do know that exams are a large portion of your grade and you want to do well. But when you start to overstress yourself, you get distracted. If you start thinking about your performance on the exam, then that distracts you from doing the math. And uh, certainly the last thing you should do during an exam is start computing your grade. Uh, we see that a lot where students write down what their scores will be. They're not usually correct. Sometimes they actually get more points than they thought. Uh, sometimes. So the other thing I want to say is I see this a lot when we do these review sessions is people will take problems that we talk about in the review session or that they saw on the quiz and they'll force that technique on an exam problem. Now most of these problems were written before I saw the exam problems. There are several of the problems today that when we talk about you're going to be like, ah, yes, I'm glad I went to the review because this was very similar. But there's going to be a lot of problems we talk about today which bear very little resemblance just because there's so many different variations that we can do. So don't try to force things. Let the math flow. You're a vessel and you're going to let the math flow through you and life is good. All right, well with that, we've got uh, I think 14 problems or so and let's begin. So, we'll do a nice warm-up problem and then we'll start uh, challenging ourselves a little bit. So find the integral of tangent cubed x secant to the fourth x dx. Now whenever you see an integral, if it only involves tangents and secants, you have sort of three things in the back of your mind that you should be like, okay, I'm going to draw on those three facts. So the three facts, will, well, we'll just put it over here, is that if you take tangent squared plus one, that equals secant squared. Now, the other two are related to substitutions. Namely, if you have u equals tangent, then the derivative is uh, secant squared. And if you have u equals secant, then the derivative is secant tangent. So those are the three things that you should have in the back of your mind. Whenever you see a problem and all you see are trig functions, that, namely the, specifically the tangent and secant trig functions. You're like, okay, these are my tools. Now, what's happening is that the first tool, this is actually a really cool tool. And then the philosophy is, if you have a tangent to some even number, it's essentially kind of like a secant to an even number. So in other words, you can sort of swap out powers of secants and powers of tangent. That's what the first one is saying. So that you can rewrite things. Replace tangents by secants or replace secants by tangents. There's limitations. It has to be to even powers. And the other ones say what? Well, so with that in mind, what we really want is we want to say, I would really like to have something that looks like tangent stuff. I'm going to be very vague on that. With a secant squared or secant stuff with a secant tangent. That's what the last two things are telling us. All right, so now we're, with all that in mind, we look at our problem. And we say, okay, what can we do? Well, 
sometimes there's more than one way to do a problem. And uh, we're not testing you on, did you guess which way we chose? Any way that you do a problem that is correct, we'll get the points. Any way that you do a problem that is incorrect, you won't get the points. Uh, people have been offended when we, they didn't get full points for the wrong answer. Um, but that's sort of the philosophy. You have to get the right answer. Uh, so don't, don't try to say, I wonder which way they tried. So for this problem, what would you say? Well, the idea is, let's see if we can do one of these. So here I see, OK, if I pulled off, say, a secant squared on the end, because I do have a, a secant squared inside that secant to fourth. I can think of that secant squared secant squared. Now the question is, can I write what's left as tangent stuff? And the answer is, well, yes, I can. Because see, that's secant to an even, and secant to an even looks like tangent to an even. And so what I can do is I use this rule. So that says, you know, this is like tangent cubed of x uh, times, and secant squared is tangent squared plus 1. Tangent squared plus 1 times secant squared. Or we could write this as tangent to the fifth x plus tangent cubed x secant squared x dx. Now at this point we like, all right, what do we do to finish off? We've written as tangent stuff with the secant squared on the end, so we make our substitution. u equals tangent of x, du equals secant squared x, and we get u to the fifth plus u cubed du. Life is good. We like these kinds of integrals because they're integrals that we can do. 1 6 u to the sixth plus 1 fourth u to the fourth plus a constant c. <clears throat> Don't forget your plus c. We will take points off if you forget it. Now, don't just put down plus c if, if that's the only thing. If you, you have to have something plus c. Uh, people often say, well, look, plus c, I get like one point. No, no, come on, do something. You've got to have something. All right, so finish off. Don't forget you've got to go back. And write everything in terms of your variable. So 1 6 tangent to the 6 plus 1 4 tangent to the 4th. All right, so that's our answer. Now, I said there could have been multiple ways, and since we're warming up, if we try to do it the other way, what would we do? Well, the other way, see here, we said let's try pulling off a secant squared. The other way is let's try to pull off a secant tangent. So if we had done that, we'd have a tangent squared x times a secant cubed x. I'm pulling off a, a single tangent, a single secant, times a secant tangent dx. And the question is, can I write that all in terms of secant? And the answer is, well, yes. Because here, tangent is to an even power. And tangent to an even power looks like secant to an even power. So you could replace this. Tangent squared becomes secant squared minus 1 times secant cubed of x times our secant x tangent x dx. So you let u equal secant x. Then you have your du equals secant x tangent x dx. And what do you end up with? Well, that's your du on the end. And in the front, you get u squared minus 1 times u cubed. If you multiply that out, that would be u to the fifth minus u cubed. And so it's very similar. So you get 1 6 u to the six minus 1 fourth u to the fourth plus c. And you're probably at this point saying, Steve, it's a mistake. You had a plus a fourth. That's a minus a fourth. Well, it's different u's. So it's OK. Because we have to go all the way back, 1 6 secant to the 6x minus 1 fourth secant to the 4th x plus c. And you might wonder, is it still the right answer? Because the answers look different. And it is. It is. That's the fun thing about trig. Your answers can look very different. That's also the very challenging thing about trig. Your answers can look very different. And Unfortunately, when you have trigonometry, there's lots of ways to do things. So you have to be careful. And we'll talk more about trig as we go on. Number two, find the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over t times natural log of e to the 2 times t times natural log of e to the uh, 4 times t. All right. 
Well, certainly right away we see something about this integral. Namely, the fact that there's an infinity involved. When we see infinity, we know this is going to be an improper integral. Now, we won't worry about it being improper until we need to. So that's one aspect. The other thing we see is like, huh, how in the world are we going to integrate this? Now, sort of one of your intuitive things you should think of is when you see logs, and we'll see this later on, if we saw a log, one of the oftentimes the way we approach it is to think of, well, what can I do uh, like an integration by parts? But that's if we have a natural log upstairs. The natural log here is downstairs. So currently, it's not so clear what we can do. So if you're faced with a situation where it's not so clear what you can do with the function, the answer is not to move on to the next problem. Well, you can, but come back to this one. Because remember, you only get to drop four problems all semester. Save them for the final. All right, so what do we do? Well, what we do is we say, let's think of ways we can rewrite our expression. Now, there's sort of a clue that the fact that we see logs involved, and we also see the 1 over t showing up. 1 over t is the derivative of log, which makes us think, OK, perhaps there's some substitution to make. But 1 over t would, would be the derivative if I took just natural log of t. And I don't quite have that. I have natural log of e to the 2t and natural log of e to the 4t. These are a little bit different. So now we can start thinking about, well, do we have some properties of natural logs? I think we do. Uh, what can we do when we have natural log of e to the 2 times t? Well. There's a few basic facts about logs. Namely, if I take two things multiplying together, take the log, that's the same as adding. So log of a times b is log of a plus log of b. Now there's a few other things. If you have log of a divided by b, that's your natural log of a minus your natural log of b. If you have natural log of a raised to the power b, then you can bring this exponent down. So that's b times the natural log of a. So these are sort of the, the strong, nice formulas for natural log. Now, what that allows us to do is it says this natural log of e to the 2 times t is the same as natural log of e to the 2 plus natural log of t. Because I can see the fact I have a multiplication going on inside. Natural log of e to the 2, what's that going to be? 2. So this is really 2 plus natural log of t. Now by the same idea, this natural log of e to the 4 times t, well, it's natural log of e to the 4 plus natural log of t, which becomes 4 plus natural log of t. So we haven't done anything other than use some properties of algebra, which is great stuff, that algebra. Highly recommend it to rewrite. So we're, we're just used the property of logs to expand what's downstairs. And now we come back to something that was mentioned a little earlier. Namely, we saw this 1 over t showing up, and we know that 1 over t is the derivative of natural log. And we now have natural log showing up in our pieces. So this is suggestive. And what it's suggesting is to make a substitution. And yes, even though we haven't talked about substitution, you should be ready to make them. Substitutions are very useful. If we set u equals the natural log of t, what's du? 1 over t. One over t. Good. And so what we end up with here is we end up with an integral. 1 over t dt is our du. And we have 1 over... 2 plus natural log of t, 2 plus u. 4 plus natural log of t, 4 plus u. All right, do we need to do anything else? The bounds, you've got to get the bounds. So these bounds up here are u bounds. So it's really u equals 1, sorry, sorry, t bounds, t equals 1, t 
to t equals infinity. We want to get u bounds, u equals something to u equals something. So when t equals 1, what does u equal? 0. When t equals infinity, what does u equal? Infinity. Now, you might say, that doesn't sound right, Steve. OK, let's talk about that. Because we can't say t is infinity. Infinity is not a number. So what do we mean when we say, well, t is infinity? What we really mean is, as t goes to infinity, so anytime you see infinity showing up, we really mean as you get bigger and bigger, as you head to infinity, because you never quite get there, what happens to you? So the answer here is you say, okay, natural log just gets bigger and bigger. So that's what we mean by saying u is infinity. All right, so we've made a substitution. What has our problem become? Partial fractions. Partial fractions because we have a polynomial upstairs over a polynomial downstairs. And so the problem, it didn't look like partial fractions to begin with. You rewrite it, and there it is, a hidden partial fractions. We've done that before. OK, so we do a little bit of work on the side. 1 over 2 plus u, 4 plus u is equal to something, we don't know yet what, over 2 plus u plus something else over 4 plus u. So we clear our denominators. Multiply both sides by 2 plus u times 4 plus u. We'll get 1 is equal to a times 4 plus u plus b times 2 plus u. And at this point, there's a couple of different techniques. Uh, for right now, let's just use the simplest technique. You use the simplest technique you can, and if that doesn't give you the full answer, then go to another technique to finish what you need. So I like, and this is a personal preference, to pick nice values for you. So I see negative 2 is a nice value because that will make the second term be 0. And so if we pick that, what do we get? Well, we get that 1 is equal to 2 times a, or a equals a half. Another nice value is negative 4 because if we pick negative 4, the first term will be 0, and that will give us that 1 is equal to negative 2 times b, or b equals negative a half. So that says we have the following. Our integral is still the same integral, 0 to infinity. Of, uh, but we now apply this. So we're going to have 1 half, I'll write that in front, times 1 over 2 plus u, minus 1 half times 1 over 4 plus u du. And these are easy to integrate. What's the integral of 1 over 2 plus u? Yeah, natural log of 2 plus u. And here we have minus a half natural log of 4 plus u. And we're going to evaluate from 0 to infinity. Now comes the part. You can kind of avoid limits for quite a while. And then you ask the question, what happens at infinity? Now, when we plug infinity in, what do we see? Well, we see a huge thing minus a huge thing. So that's not so clear what that is. That's uh, indeterminate. Now, if it's not indeterminate, maybe it goes to zero. And then it's like, OK, that's the answer. If it's indeterminate, well, we have to do something, which means one of the things you can do is say, well, let me clean it up. What can we do with these two expressions? We can combine them through the powers of logs. So that's 1 half log of 2 plus u divided by 4 plus u as we go from 0 to infinity. OK, now from here you might say, OK, what's happening? Now, whenever you see infinity, there's always a built-in limit. So you have to think about what's the limit? What's it happening to this limit? So for us, we say, OK, uh, one thing, if we weren't clear, we could. And uh, it's perfectly fine to do this. If it's, if it's an unambiguous, we usually don't say you have to include a limit. If it's not unambiguous, well, we say, look, include a limit. So I could, for example, do this, 1 half log of 2 plus b over 4 plus b. So that's what would be 
to understand when I plug in infinity, I really take a limit as I head to infinity of b, and then uh, I can subtract. Well, what happens when I plug in zero? Well, zero is not so bad because it's two over four on the inside. So it's one half log of one half. Now we just sort of think over here. And in this case, it's not so bad because look, we can push it all the way in. Two plus b over four plus b. What does that do as b gets big? Goes to one because the, the highest powers are the b's. And those coefficients are one and one. Log of one is zero. So this whole expression goes to zero. So again, if you need limits, put it in. If you don't need limits, you're fine without them. And you're confident you don't need them, then that's fine. So we end up with minus one half log of one half. That's the answer. All right. Now you might not like that answer because it seems very negative on, and it looks like our function should not be negative. <coughs> It turns out, though, this is a positive number because log of a half is, is, is a negative value. So it's a, it is a positive value. All right, I'm kind of waving my hands a little bit at the end. Are you Any questions about that last part? Let me be clear, if I haven't said it before, feel free to say, I'm not sure what you're doing. Can you explain that some more? Yes? When you plug in infinity to b, how does that cancel out again to be one? Well, so yeah, so when you're, we're plugging infinity, of course, what we really mean is as we're getting bigger and bigger. So when you have a polynomial over a polynomial, which is what the inside is, so we can say look, what's happening on the inside. When it's polynomial over polynomial, you look at the leading coefficients. And the leading coefficients, and when we say leading coefficients, not of the two and the four. The two and the four aren't the leading coefficients. You look at the highest powers. The highest po powers are the b's. And you look at, at those leading coefficients, they're one and one. So essentially what it is, is that those are the terms that dominate. The two and the four are insignificant when b gets big. And so that's what we're looking at. Why are the natural logs no longer written as an absolute value? Why are natural logs no longer written as an absolute value? Um, partially because I'm lazy, but partially because everything in here, everything we put into a natural log in this problem is a positive number. <coughs> And so if you're confident that what you put into your natural log is positive, you don't need the absolute value. And when in doubt, throw the absolute value in. So that's the answer for absolute values. So as b like goes up to infinity, wouldn't that still be infinity over infinity then in that indeterminate? Yeah. Right, but you can, you can, okay. Someone wants me to uh, <coughs> break out my L'Hopital routine. All right. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Oh, all right. So what we can do is you can really s look. I can push it and say this is the part that matters. That's the part where I need to figure it out. So let's let's take a look. So limit b goes to infinity of two plus b over four plus b. And it is true that currently it goes to infinity over infinity. So I say okay. All right. All right. Indeterminate. So we're like, oh, 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 what are we going to do? Oh, okay, so we can do, if you're not comfortable with looking at highest coefficients, the hopital. All right, which means we take the derivative of both top and bottom. And if we take the derivative of the top, remember that b is our variable. What's the derivative of 2 plus b? And derivative of 4 plus b? 1. And what is that limit? 1. Yeah. And that's, by the way, why the leading coefficients, the, the coefficients of the highest powers, are important. Because when you apply the Hopital, you just keep taking derivatives until you're only left with your coefficients with highest powers and then some extra stuff which cancels off. So that's what you can do. So when in doubt, you can always channel your inner Le Hopital. Well, that's what some people will think. All right. Number three. Find the integral of cosine cubed of x sine of sine of x dx. All right. Well, this should be uh, hmm, interesting. All right. Now, your initial reaction on, on 
seeing that, it's probably like, huh, huh, is that possible? See, what's the challenge? The challenge is you have a sine of x that's inside another function. So it's like a function inside of a function. And that's sort of tricky to work with. So when we see functions and functions, which are non-trivial, what's our tool to make things look better? Substitution is our tool. Substitution helps us with functions inside of functions. So we're going to say, well, let's for the moment, uh, let's make a substitution. I'll say, I'll let t equal sine of x. I can choose any symbol I want. And you might say, shouldn't we always go with u? And the answer is, you want to be careful because you don't know what the future holds. So let's go with t for now. And the nice thing is we have lots of symbols. All right, so that's going to be the inside. What will dt be? Cosine of x dx. All right, good. So, hmm, what do we have a cosine of x? And we actually have three cosine of x's. Okay, so this cosine cubed is really cosine squared times cosine. All right, so that handles one of the cosines. What do I do with the cosine squared? Yeah, so cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared, which will become 1 minus t squared. So this becomes the integral of 1 minus t squared times, so that's the cosine squared, sine of t times, then the cosine of x dx becomes dt. Now this is not so bad, right? Because it's just sine of t is the first piece. I can break that off and then minus the integral of t squared sine of t. So I'm just multiplying that out and breaking it up into two integrals. Because when I have addition or subtraction, I'm allowed to break things into part. So sine of t, t squared sine of t. It's already looking better. The first integral, do we know how to integrate sine of t? Yes. What is the integral of sine of t? Negative cosine. Good. That's a very low cost to, to figure that one out. All right. How do we integrate t squared sine of t? Integration by parts. Yeah. So you want to learn to recognize these things. So if you see like a polynomial times a trig function, that's a parts problem. All right, so let's figure out our parts. In this case, it's not so bad. When you have sine or cosine, differentiating or integrating doesn't make any difference. But polynomials, you always want to differentiate those because the more you differentiate a polynomial, the better it looks. In other words, if you take enough derivatives, it, it goes away. So that says the polynomial part, that's our u. The sine of t will be our dv. du is 2t dt. And uh, the integral of sine, well, we already know what that is. That's negative cosine. All right. So we have the minus cosine t from the start. Then we have this minus sign. And be careful. Whenever you have a minus sign and you do an integration by parts on something, it's very easy to lose a sign. And if you lose a sign, you lose a point. So we're going to use some preventative safety technology. We call it a parenthesis. And uh, so, okay, so I have parenthesis, okay, u, v. So we have t squared times minus cosine t. <coughs> then we're going to take minus the integral of v du. All right, so minus, and I'll put the 2t in front, times the minus cosine t dt. Okay, so let's clean it up a little bit before we go to our next step. So minus cosine t, minus distributes through to both terms. Minus minus makes a plus t squared cosine t. And here plus, but there's a third minus. Wow, that's a lot of minuses. Minus, I'll go ahead and pull out the two, integral t cosine t. Okay, how do you integrate t cosine t? Yeah, do it by parts. It's a technique so nice, we'll do it twice. So, remember that when you do integration by parts, and you intend to do it multiple times, you've got to stay committed. In other words, if you had to use your polynomial, it's still got to be the polynomial. 
And if you had your DV as your trig part, it's still got to be the, the DV. The DV still has to be the trig part. You can't, you can't change your mind. All right, DU, pretty simple, DT, V, integral of cosine, sine. Okay, so we're almost there. So we have uh, minus cosine T plus T squared cosine T, just copying, minus two, parenthesis, UV, T sine T, then minus the integral of V du, which is sine of T dt. All right, and uh, all right, we can just put on the N. So the integral of, of sine of T, we've already done that because we did it where? We did that up here, yeah, the integral of sine. It's negative cosine. Okay, and then there's a plus C thrown on the end. All right, let's, uh, next line, write it all out. So we got minus cosine T plus T squared cosine of T. The minus two distributes, so minus two T sine of T. Minus two times a minus times another minus. Okay, so that's gonna still be a minus two times cosine of T plus C. Well, notice we have cosine of t showing up twice. So one thing we can do is we can put these together. So I'll go ahead and do that. That means that this 2 becomes a 3. Now, are we done? No, because we need to end with x. So we go back. Everywhere we see a t, we, we put sine. So we get sine squared of x times cosine of sine of x minus 2 sine of x, sine of sine of x, minus 3 cosine of sine of x, plus c. And there you go. Now, I will say, I know this problem looks, looks intimidating, I would say that after the first step, this is the kind of problem which we've had on exams before. So y this part you should feel absolutely comfortable with. The reason I, I'm starting here is just to sort of help you see, oh, look, for substitutions to make. Yes? The, um, right before you did the second uh, uh, integration by parts, would uh, the negative cosine t and neg uh, mi minus the negative cosine t, wouldn't that be a plus, a positive? Yes, but remember, the question is, there's two negatives, but there's actually three negatives. It's very negative right now. It's super negative, so there's three of them. Yeah, yeah, got to be careful, yeah. It's easy to lose your signs. Don't lose your signs, okay. All right. We should probably pick up our speed a little bit. Well... I'm sure the second half of the problems will be simpler. Find the integral from negative infinity to zero of e to the 3t over 4 minus e to the 2t to the 3 halves dx. And we say, oh, look, it's uh, one of those unpleasant improper integrals because there's a minus infinity involved. Well, okay, we'll, we'll deal with it when we have to deal with it. All right, but what else is involved? Yeah, so notice a couple things. You, you should start looking for clues. So you see here, there's this over two part. That means it's really like a square root is involved. And when you see a square root, you're like, ooh, let me look on the inside of the square root. Is there anything being added or subtracted? And the answer is, yeah, there's a subtraction sign. So when you see stuff being added and subtracted, what do you think? Trig sum. So this could be a problem that we could try trig substitution on. Now, here's a, a nice little fun fact. And we use this a lot. I, I don't want to call it a trick, but it's, it's, let's just say it's cool. All right, so if I have e to the k times t, where k is just some arbitrary constant, that's the same as e to the t to the kth power. So what, why do we do this? Well, because it helps us sort of obscure what's going on. If we apply that here, 
we see, lo and behold, this can become negative infinity to zero of e to the t cubed over 4 minus e to the t squared to the 3 halves. The, oh, that should have been a, a t there, I'm sorry, dt. There we go. All right. Well, now, where do we go next? Well, Any thoughts? We could go kind of crazy, or we could be more relaxed. Okay, let's just throw in and, and, and try to confuse people, right? Yes? Yes, someone is saying, go for it, Steve, confuse us. Yes, okay. So we're thinking tricks up, so let's just remember our, our basic rules for tricks up. If we see something that looks like a square root of a squared minus u squared, well, w that says you should make your substitution u equals a sine theta. You see square root of a squared plus u squared, that says make your substitution a tangent theta. And if you see u squared minus a squared, that should be your secant theta. These are your sort of your go-to defaults that you should use. All right, so those are our go-to defaults. And we say, you know what? This is kind of looking like 2 squared minus e to the t squared. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. So this e to the t is our u. And 2 is our a. So according to the rule, we should have u, which is e to the t, should equal 2 times, uh, we're in the first case, sine theta. So that's the substitution that's being suggested. Now you might say, do we have to make such a big leap? Uh, no, you could do an intermediate step. You could say, well, let's let u equal e to the t get everything in terms of u's, and then now we can do something where we have u equals 2 sine theta. But we can jump straight ahead, because this u can be anything. We often do this, by the way, when we do the completing the square, where we say, oh, okay, the, the completing the square part, that's our u. All right, so where to go from here? Well, e to the t dt, take derivatives, is to cosine theta d theta. And now we say, well, we, we have three e to the t's upstairs. So we'll replace this e to the t cubed by e to the t squared times e to the t. So we get the following. This is the integral of e to the t squared. So e to the t becomes 2 sine theta squared. So that's my e to the t squared. e to the t dt becomes... 2 cosine theta d theta. Now downstairs we have what? Well, 4 minus, and e to the t would be 2 sine theta squared to the power of 3 halves. All right, well, we should clean that up. So first off, the downstairs, this, this becomes 4 minus 4 sine squared theta to the power of 3 halves, which is really... 4 times 1 minus sine squared theta to the power of 3 halves. 1 minus sine squared, cosine squared. So 4 to the 3 halves. What's, what is 4 to the 3 halves? 8. Cosine squared to the 3 halves. Cosine cubed. So we have 8 times cosine cubed. All right, so this downstairs part is going to be 8 times cosine cubed theta. And finally, uh, we, there's one thing we have to take care of, which is the bounds. Okay, so let's think about our bounds. These are my t bounds. When t is negative infinity, well, what happens to e to the t as t goes to negative infinity? Goes to zero. Gets very small. So that says I need sine of theta to be zero. What angle has sine of theta equal to zero? Zero. <coughs> All right, so zero. 
Now, plug in zero. E to the zero is what? One. So that means I need sine of theta equal a half. So what angle, if you think in terms of our unit circle, sine is our y value, by the way. So sine of zero equals zero would be here. Sine equals a half would be here. What angle do I get sine of a half? Pi over six. All right. Well, we're almost there. We're getting close. So what do we have? Well, hmm, we, zero to pi over six. Upstairs we have four sine squared theta times two cosine theta. I'll just multiply that out really quickly. Eight cosine cubed theta. I just want to clean it up. The four and the two and the eight all cancel off. I have one cosine upstairs. So I'll cancel with two downstairs. So I end up with sine squared over cosine squared, which by the way, sine squared over cosine squared, what is that equal to? Tangent squared. How do you integrate tangent squared? Close. Secant squared minus one. All right. We don't integrate tangent squared. We replace tangent squared in terms of secants. So secant squared minus one. Integral of secant squared. Tangent. Integral of one. Theta. And we're going from 0 up to pi over 6. Tangent of pi over 6, well, that one we would probably would just give it to you. Does anybody here know it? Yeah, it's the square root of 3 over 3. And then we subtract. Tangent of 0 is 0. So you end up with 1 third square root of 3 minus pi over 6. All right, good. Yes? Uh, sure. What did you uh, set your balance equal to in order to get that uh, one again? Did you just make like sine of negative infinity or? To get here? Yeah, to, to get to zero. Well, to get to zero, so remember this is our t bound. So we have t equals negative infinity. So we ask ourselves the question, what happens when we plug in negative infinity? Well, you can't plug negative infinity in. So you say, well, what happens as you go to minus infinity? So e to a really large negative number. It's like 1 over a really e to a big positive number, which is really tiny, collectively. So this is going to 0 as t goes to negative infinity. In other words, you should know that e of the t looks like this. It's that exponential function. And as you head off in that direction, it goes to small, goes to 0. Yes? Generally speaking, you don't need the reference triangle, um, especially when you, you update your bounds, you don't need to worry about the reference triangle. When you update your bounds, you always move forward and you never move back. If you don't update your bounds, uh, why didn't you update your bounds? You should have updated your bounds. So anyways, I encourage you to update your bounds when you can. If not, things can get a little tricky. All right. Ah, it's a picture problem. Use the picture of the curve y equals f of x below. Here it is. To do the following. Uh, estimate the area under the curve f of x for 1 to 9 using the trapezoid rule with four equal intervals. And estimate the area under f of x for 1 to 9 using Simpson's rule with four equal intervals. So if I want to go from 1 to 9, and you see it's this piece shaded in blue, that says I want to split it into four parts. So I can go halfway and then halfway in between those. So those are my four intervals. And uh, what do I need? Well, according to the trapezoid rule, our basic formula would be you take b minus a over 2n, and then it's your f of x0 plus 2f of x1 plus 2f of x2. And it, and it keeps going until almost the end. And then on the end, we only include it once. Okay, and that's our, our formula for the trapezoid rule. So we apply it here. B minus A, 8, 9 minus 1. N is 4, so it's 8 over 8, which is 1. So OK, for us, this is going to equal to 1. And so what do we need? We need to have F at 1 plus 2 
f at 3 plus 2 f at 5 plus 2 times f at 7 plus f at 9. So now we go and we read it off. Well, the function at 1 is 1. Okay, so that's 1. The function at 3 is 4. So this is 2 times 4. And the function at 5 is 3. So 2 times 3. The function at 7 is, oh, there it is. It's also 4. So 2 times 4. And the function at 9 is 6. Okay, so we have 1 plus 8 plus 6 plus 8 plus 6. And if we added all those together, I think you get 29. Because 6 plus 6 plus 8 is 20, and then 29. Okay, so there's our answer. Now, if the numbers are unpleasant, you don't have to do the arithmetic. In fact, we might say, don't do the arithmetic, because it's easier for us to make sure you did, knew what you were doing, and we don't grade, grade you on it. So keep that in mind. On the other hand, if we say simplify as much as possible, get to the answer. Now, part B is very similar. It, well, but slightly different. B minus A, what goes down? 3N. Okay, and the thing about Simpson's rule is it's sort of a stranger pattern. Because it, here it's like, okay, two, 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 in the middle, then one's in the end. Simpson's rule, it's one, then four, and then two. Whoops, I forgot my F there. Uh, two, F of X, two, plus four, F. You know, it, it's a sort of alternating thing. And so you have to be careful. The other thing you have to keep in mind with Simpson's rule is you can only apply it if there's an even number of intervals, but if we ask you to do Simpson's rule, we'll give you an even number of intervals because we know you have to have an even number. We know these things. We know things. Okay, so it's still the B minus A is the same. It's still going to be 8. Downstairs, it's still 3 times 4. Well, okay, well, that's 12. So it's 8 twelfths, uh, which you could simplify that to say uh, 2 thirds. Yes? Okay. But now, uh, so we're going to have two-thirds times, and our pattern is one, so f of one, and then four, f of three, two, that'll be f of uh, five, four, f seven, and then back to one on the end. And so we, we plug these values in. We've already computed them, so we don't have to recompute them. One. Then here we're going to get 4 times 4. Here we'll get 2 times 3. Here we'll get 4 times 4. And here we'll get 6. So, so we have 2 thirds times 1 plus 16 plus 8 plus 16 uh, plus 6. Well, that's a, a bigger number. Let's see. What is it? Really? Wow, that's... that's that's a. Shouldn't it's 47? Okay. The H should be 6. Oh, yeah, that would help. Check your work. You know, you're probably thinking, you know, we should have everybody take a test in front of 200 people. You know, that would make it easier. It's a little bit nerve wracking. Okay, all right. So 45. Well, 45 times 2 thirds, that's actually something we can do. Because 45 divides into, uh, sorry, 45 is divisible by 3, and that becomes 15. 2 times 15 is 30. Now, by the way, there's a check. If you're asked to do both the trapezoidal and Simpson's rule, what should be true about these numbers? They should be close. So if you've got one of them is like 29 and the other one is like 71, something is definitely wrong. They, should be, they don't have to be equal because they're both estimates. And your estimate might be slightly different than somebody else's estimate. All right. Number, number six. Find the following improper integral. Indicate any limits needed. Now, there's no infinity in the bounds. Why is this improper? Because of zero. Yeah, zero's a problem. So we're going to actually 
follow the rules and indicate any limits needed. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. So one of the ways to do definite integrals is to say, well, let me forget about the bounds for a second. Let me just do the indefinite integral. I'll work with that, then I'll come back and worry about bounds. So suppose you had the following integral, which we actually do. e to the q root of x over the q root of x dx. What would be the first thing for us to do in trying to work with this integral? I would do a substitution first. I suspect parts is going to be involved because I see an exponential function and something algebraic, the q root of x. But the fact that I have a, a sort of an unpleasant function inside of the exponential function says, let's do a substitution to help us simplify what it looks like. So we're going to let u equal the cube root of x, also known as, secretly, x to the one-third. It's not a very good secret because a lot of people know that. What does du become? So one-third x to the negative two-thirds. Yeah. Or if you move that across, dx is 3 times x to the positive two-thirds du. And x to the two-thirds, I can replace that. I know that x to one-third is u. So this is really the same as 3 times u squared du. So we can say, well, this is really the integral of e to the u divided by u, because that's the cube root of x, and the dx is 3u squared du. All right. Well, notice, very conveniently, those powers cancel. So what we have, uh, well, rather I should say 1u cancels. So what we get is 3u e to the u du. Now, how do we integrate this? Parts, exactly. And now I regret my choice of u. See, this is why you should be really careful about u's, right? Because you're going to confuse yourself. All right, so we're going to make these uh, still u's. Okay, and we're just going to have to live with being confused. Well, you know what? No, I'm going to double down. These are now double U's. <laughs> no one, no one will, will notice this unless they watch the video, but that's okay. All right. Wow, look, flawless. All right, good. Okay, so now, which part's the U part? Yeah, so U equals 3W. Which part is the DV? Yeah, the other puff. Ah! Uh, now I'm thinking too much about this. I, you shouldn't overthink things. You should th just think. All right, derivative of u, 3 dw, integral of e to the w, e to the w. So this becomes, you have your uv, 3 times w, e to the w, and then minus the integral of v du. So that's minus the integral of 3 times e to the w, uh, dw, and that's an easy integral, so that's 3w e to the w minus 3e to the w, tack on a plus c. To finish, we've got to go all the way back, which means we've got to replace what w is. Uh, by the way, one thing we can do is we can factor out a 3 and an e to the w times w minus 1. So we get 3e to the cubed root of x times the cubed root of x minus 1. Okay, so there's our antiderivative. So now we come back here. So 0 to 1 of e to the cubed root of x over the cubed root of x dx. And here it's saying indicate any limits needed. That says it's an instruction to include limits. If it doesn't tell us to include limits, we can sometimes sort of sidestep that. But if it tells you to do something, you should do it. Because if you don't follow instructions, you could lose points, and we don't want that. We want to get them all. So our problem is at 0, so we're going to approach 0 from above. Then we're going to go integral a to 1 of e to the cubed root of x over cubed root of x. That's, that's the limit that we need to look at. Well, we know how to take that antiderivative. So that's limit as a approaches 0 from above of... There's our antiderivative, 3 e to the cubed root of, ah, 3 e to the 
q root of x times q root of x minus 1. Evaluate that from a to 1. Well, all right, limit as a goes to 0 from above, do the evaluation. Plug in 1, we're going to get 3 times e to the 1, which is e, times 1 minus 1, which is 0. Minus, and we get 3 e to the cubed root of a times the cubed root of a minus 1. Now, what happens as a goes to 0? That part goes to zero, because there's no longer division by zero. That's gone away. How about this e to the cube root of a? What does that go to? It goes to one, because it's e to the zero. So we have negative three times one times zero minus one, which is negative one. Negative three times negative one is also known as three. And there's our answer. That's a nice answer. All right. Where did that zero come from? Which zero? <coughs> this one? Yeah. This one? Aha! 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 That zero oh, plugged, in. plugged in one. Oh, okay. That's where it came from. Gotcha. Yeah. Normally it's the lower bound that where, where it zeroes out, but in this case it was the upper bound. All right. Number seven. Find all b positive such that the integral from 1 to infinity of b divided by x squared plus b squared dx is equal to 1. Oh, well, this should be good times, good times. All right. Yes, it's, it's improper. We'll worry about limits when we need to worry about limits. But our goal now is find the b. Find the b. All right, so how are we going to find it? Well... Hmm, how do we integrate something like b over x squared plus b squared? It's a lot like arctangent. So if you remember the formula for x squared plus b squared, you're okay. If you don't remember the formula for x squared plus b squared, what do you do? And the answer is not, okay, this is one of my four drops. The answer is, <laughs> what do you do? Uh, not integration by parts. It's a trig sub. X squared plus b squared is a trig sub. Do you, what's, the, what's the substitution to make? Tangent. Tangent. Yeah. So if you were just doing integral of b over x squared plus b squared, you'd let x equal b tangent theta. Then dx is b secant squared theta, d theta. So what you'd end up with is you'd have that b from before then dx has another b, so now there's two b's upstairs. And then downstairs you have b squared tangent squared plus b squared. But b squared, uh, you can pull that out of the denominator to get tangent squared plus 1. And tangent squared plus 1 is also known as secant squared. And we say, whoa, wait a second, that says the denominator matches the numerator which means you're integrating d theta, which is theta. All right, now we're not done. What's theta? Well, you come back here. We, we say, well, x over b equals tangent theta, because I'm working to get the theta by itself. So theta is the arctangent of x over b. You know what? We had to have arctangent show up at least once on the review. No, you know that it's going to show up again. Once is not enough for arc tangents. Too important. Okay. So anyways, that's the antiderivative. So that's not so bad. All right. So now back to work. Back to work. So that's the antiderivative. So we want to say 1 to infinity of b over x squared plus b squared dx. We know that equals 1 because that's what we want. So that equals uh, arc tangent of x over b evaluated from 1 to infinity. So now we can do our evaluation. And here is where we can either say, let's throw a limit in, or we just say, we know what happens. 
Do we know what happens to arctangent as what you plug in gets bigger and bigger? <sighs> Where have I failed you? So our tangent looks like that. So as you get bigger, what do we approach? Pi over, pi over 2. Good, good. So you could throw a limit in there and say, hey, look, I just see what's happening when I go to infinity. So we, oftentimes we say, well, you plug in infinity. You never plug in infinity. When you say plug in infinity, you really mean as you go to infinity. So there's a, a limit involved. So you get pi over 2 minus uh, arc tangent of 1 over b. Okay. Now, so that's cool. So this says we need 1 to equal pi over 2 minus the arc tangent of 1 over b. But what are we looking for? We're looking for b. So what do we want to do? We want to get b by itself. So what's our next thing to do? Well, we start rearranging things. So, for instance, we can move those things around. Arc tangent of 1 over b is equal to pi halves minus 1. Now, how do we get rid of the arc tangent? Because the 1 over b is currently inside of an arc tangent. <coughs> Take the tangent of both sides. 1 over b is equal to tangent of pi halves minus 1. Now, how do we change 1 over b to be just plain old b? Well, you just flip it over. If you flip tangent over, well, that's 1 over tangent. What's another name for 1 over tangent? Cotangent. Now, for all you trig lovers out there, cotangent of pi halves minus 1 can be rewritten in another way. Cotangent of pi halves minus 1 equals, does anybody know? Tangent of 1. What? You're probably like, what? Okay, so why is that true? Think of the triangle. So if I have an angle here, let's call it alpha, what's the angle over here? We'll call it beta, all right. What's true about alpha and beta? They have to 90 degrees. We call them complements. They're complementary to each other. Alpha, you look wonderful today. Well, thank you, beta. I, this is some, a, a new suit I'm trying on. And beta, you too. Have you lost weight? No, it's just a fancier B. All right. So anyways, they're complements to each other. They're complementary angles. So the moral is, if you take tangent of this angle, opposite over adjacent there, and you compare it to cotangent of this angle, which would be its adjacent over its opposite, you see they match up. So in general, like the sine of an angle matches the cosine of the complementary angle. The, so, the secant of an angle matches the cosecant of the complementary angle. The tangent of an angle matches the cotangent of the complementary angle. The co comes from complementary. Okay, so that means we can move on to our next problem. All right, good. And like I said, I, it's time for us to maybe pick up speed a little bit. So we'll start picking up speed a little bit, not too much. When you look at this problem, the integral from 0 to 1 of 9 times the square root of z times natural log of 1 plus z, it's not clear what to do right away. But I do claim that there is a bit of a hint. And Yes, I can see that. I should, I should fix that. All right. There is a bit of a hint about this problem about what technique you should use. And uh, well, I got, I'll ask you, what technique should we use? Parts. Parts. The hint is the natural log. When you see a natural log sitting there, natural log is one of those functions where it's kind of hard to integrate by itself, but beautiful derivative. It just sort of like... It feels like a warm hug when you take the derivative of a natural log. And so natural log is one of those things that if I see it, I'm thinking parts. And in particular, this better be the part I differentiate because it's easy to differentiate. So that means this other part, that's the part we're going to integrate. 
So du is 1 over 1 plus z dz. And let's see, what will our, our dv be? Well, hmm, uh, or, or sorry, our v. So we're integrating z to the 1 half. That'll be, give us z to the 3 halves. Then we multiply by 2 thirds. We already have a 9 in front. Multiply 9 times 2 thirds gives us 6. Uh, so what do we get? This is the same as the integral. Uh, well, actually, uh, we have bounds. OK, well, well, we'll work with the bounds. So we have u times v. So that's 6 times z to the 3 halves times the natural log of 1 plus z. And when it's a definite integral, well, you also evaluate 0 to 1 minus the integral 0 to 1. And here, 6z to the 3 halves divided by 1 plus z dz. OK, so there we go. We've made some progress. Now, the first one, well, let's just quickly evaluate this. Plug in 0 into this expression you get 0. Plug in 1. 6 times 1 times log of 2. Well, that's 6 log of 2. All right, so that's the first case. Now we come to this integral. There's no log. That's progress. But now you have this z to the 3 halves over 1 plus z. Ah, not the best thing to work with. At least not the most obvious thing of what to work with. So, any thoughts of something we can try here? Long well, long division is not bad, but to do long division, you need a polynomial upstairs. We don't have a polynomial yet, so we want to wait till we have a polynomial. So what can we do to make ourselves a polynomial? And there's no algebra that we can do that will make this into a polynomial. Sorry, what? Can you pull the 6 out? Can pull the 6 out. That, that will, you know, we can do that. I suspect the 6 will be helpful at some point in the future. Mind you, I just think it might be. I'm not claiming that it will be. Well, here's maybe not the most obvious thing to try, but notice there's another way to think of this z to the 3 halves. It's like the square root of z cubed. Okay. I don't think that's a surprising thing. So what we can do is we have had the challenge before where it's like, oh, like e to the cubed root of x or sine of sine of x or things like that. It's like, oh, we have this unpleasant function on the inside. The square root is the unpleasantness. So let's make a substitution. Let's say, let's let t equal the square root of z. And let's just follow through what that means. Uh, now, one of the things you can do really quickly is we can solve for dt. One of the, we, we've done this before, but let me show you a different way you, you can solve for it. If I square both sides, that says t squared will be equal to z. And uh, now take the derivative. 2t dt equals dz. Okay, that's what we would have gone before if we said, okay, derivative of square to z is 1 over 2 times z to the minus a half, and then move around. OK. So let's see. What do we have? We still have our 6 log 2, which we're going to have to keep rewriting a lot for a while. And if, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I wrote down 0 and 1, because those were my z bounds. Sorry about that. We're switching to t bounds. See, 0 to 1, these are attached to z values. z goes from 0 to z goes to 1, not t, right? So we're not going from 0 to 1 anymore. Now we're going from 0 to 1. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. All right. Um, because the square root of 0 is 0 and the square root of 1 is 1. All right, good. So 6 times z to the 3 halves, well, that becomes 6t cubed. dz becomes 2t dt. And downstairs? 1 plus z, what does that become? 1 plus t squared. Now, what do we have? Well, we have something which is good. Namely, 
we have, uh, that'll be 12, t to the fourth over 1 plus t squared dt. We have a polynomial over a polynomial. Before we didn't have a rational function, now we do. Now we do. All right, you have a rational function. What's the first thing you do with rational function? Check for long division. Do we need to do long division? Yes. Someone's like, sure, why not? No, no. We do it when we need to do it. And here we have to do it. All right. t squared plus 1. You're going to divide that into 12, t to the fourth, and 0 t cubed, and 0 t squared, and 0 t. You've got you to have your placeholders. Well, you don't have to, but it's good practice to get into the habit. What do you have to multiply t squared by to get to 12 t to the fourth? 12t squared. All right, so you multiply 12t squared times t squared plus 1. That's 12t to the fourth plus 12t squared. Subtract, those cancel. You're now up to minus 12t squared. What do you have to multiply t squared by to get to minus 12t squared? Minus 12. So we have minus 12t squared minus 12. Subtract 12. Now we're done. This is our remainder. So, long division says this is 6 log of 2 minus integral 0 to 1. We haven't done any calculus. We're just rewriting the function right now when we do our long division. 12t squared minus 12. That's this part. Plus our remainder. So plus remainder over 1 plus t squared. All right. Now let's see if we can integrate these pieces minus, and I'll put a big parenthesis here. Okay, integral of 12t squared, what is that going to be? 4t cubed. Integral of 12, 12t. Integral of 12 over 1 plus t squared. 12 r tangent of t. Ah, I predicted r tangent would come back. I was right. Of course, you know, I could have I, I wrote the problem, so I, I could make our tangent come back. Will it make a third appearance? I don't remember. We'll find out. Minus, all right, plug in 1, you get 4 minus 12. Our tangent of 1, oh, I hope you know this one, pi over 4. Yeah, you should know that one. Our tangent of 1 is pi over 4. That's just, know it by heart. Or, or if not, at least, you know, try to remember it. Okay, plug in 0, what do you get? You get zero. So what do we end up with? We have our six natural log of two. Now here we have four minus 12, which is negative eight, but we're subtracting that, so that becomes positive eight. And then this 12 times pi over four, that becomes three pi, but remember there's this minus, so it ends up being minus three pi. And that's it, that's our answer. So integration by parts, do a substitution, do a long division, and then you're good to go. So you can see we're, we're combining different techniques together, and that's what happens with integrals. You always think about, okay, what's my first integral? What do I need to do right now? Well, I need to do parts right now. Okay, here's my next integral. I don't care that it came from there. I just have this integral that I have to deal with right now. What's the right technique? Okay, maybe do a substitution. All right and so forth and so on. So every time you do an integral, always focus on what's my integral right now? And am I able to keep making progress? If the answer is no, I can't keep making progress, go back a couple steps and see what happened. Number nine, find the integral. Oh, this is a indefinite integral, that's nice. One over y squared plus five y plus six quantity squared dy. Okay, nice, good. What's our technique here? Partial fractions, okay. Now, do we need to do long division here? No, no. good. <laughs> now, what's next? Do we need to factor it? Yes. yes. You might be tempted to say, oh, look, it's already like this quadratic here, and life is good. So some people might be tempted to say, shouldn't it be like, oh, ay plus b, over y squared plus 5y plus 6 plus cy plus d over y squared plus 5y plus 6 quantity squared? 
And the answer is no, it's not that necessarily. Maybe it is, and I'm going to regret crossing it out. You don't do that until you've factored as far as you can. So always check to see if you can factor. And if we give you a partial fractions problem, you will either have it factored for you, or it's going to be something that's so easy you can factor it. Can you factor this any further? Yes. So, how does y squared plus 5y plus 6 factor? Yeah, y plus 2 times y plus 3. And because it's squared, it's like y plus 2 squared, y plus 3 squared, dy. So, now we get to sort of test our skills. So, in partial fractions, the hardest part, maybe not the hardest part, but maybe the second hardest part, is getting the setup right. And if you mess the setup, then pretty much 95% of what follows, you're not going to get right. So it's really important to focus on get the setup correct. And this is true for pretty much the entire course of calculus. Focus on the, getting the start right. Because if you're not getting the start right, you get it wrong, it doesn't matter how much space you fill up on the paper. It's still wrong. All right. That sounds like a pessimistic view. But it is. y plus 2 squared y plus 3 squared. Now, here's the part that throws people off is how do you handle the squares? And there's sort of two rules. And so you should know them both. If I have something of the form, say, uh, a, all right, this is really cheesy, a y plus b, all right, all right, all right. It, uh, all right, let's just say one of my terms, here we go, that, that, this is a nice way to write. Suppose I had something like one of my terms was y plus 2 squared. All right? I'm not saying what the other stuff is. I'm just saying that one of the stuff things downstairs is y plus 2 squared. The way you handle this kind of a square is you build up. So it's y plus 2 to the first, and then it's a y plus 2 to the second. And you have a constant upstairs. The key to focus on is what kind of thing you have on the inside y plus 2 is a nice thing. It's what we call a linear function. It's factored all the way down. On the other hand, you might have something of the form y squared plus 2 downstairs. Okay? Now, in that case, you're not going to have two terms. You're going to have a single term, y squared plus 2, because y squared plus 2 cannot factor any further. Not unless you want things to get complex. And we don't want things to be complex. Our goal is to keep things simple. What goes upstairs? A y plus b. So if you have what's called an irreducible quadratic, that means you cannot factor it further, then upstairs you're going to have two pieces. If you have a linear term that's being squared, you're just going to have two different terms, one in the first power and one being squared. So make sure you know how to handle these two situations. They're both important. Either one could show up. So you want to make sure you can handle both. Because again, our goal is we're not going to have any drops on this exam. We're going to get them all. We're going to walk out of that exam, heads held high, confident that we got number seven. And we're just going to be like, yes, you can't fool me. So here we go. Notice we have that y plus 2 squared. So it's something over y plus 2 plus something over y plus 2 squared. And you also have a y plus 3 squared, so similar process. Something over y plus 3 plus something over y plus 3 squared. Now, at this point, uh, I said this was part, one of the hard parts. The other hard part is solving for a, b, c, and d. And that probably is the hardest part about a partial fractions problem. So, clear your denominators. So you get 1 is equal to a, and then you just have to figure out what doesn't cancel. There's a y plus 2 term left, and y plus 3 squared, plus b, well, y plus 3 squared, plus c. Uh, there's two y plus 2 terms, and a y plus 3, and plus d, and it's y plus 2 squared. All right, 
Before I begin this, I can already say that this one is going to be like very ah, frustrating. We don't give you a frustrating one. You should expect a nice, simple one. But I just want to, you to be prepared. Like, look, you might deal with frustrating things. There's a couple of techniques. Be comfortable with both. And if one technique, like, I can't really see a good way to apply it very well, switch to the other technique. What are the two techniques? Do you remember? Plug in nice choices is one technique, and the other technique is? Look at the coefficients. Expand it out and compare coefficients. Be ready to do both. So are there any nice choices here? All right, negative 2 is a great choice. Okay, so on the left hand we get 1. What do we get over here? It looks like the only thing that doesn't have a y plus 2 is this term. And here would be negative 2 plus 3 quantity squared, which would be b. So we've solved for b. Any other good choices? Negative 3. All right, plug in negative 3. What do you get? Well, what doesn't have a y plus 3? No, 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 no. Ah, ha, 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 That one. Negative 3 plus 2 squared would be negative 1 squared, which is 1. So 1 equals d. Now, at this point, you would probably say, ah, we've run out of good choices. And we have to switch to the other technique. The other technique would work fine, except I don't feel like it doing lots of expansion. But you know what we can do is we can just pick any number we want. It doesn't have to be a number that's great, that cancels stuff. We already know two of our four values, so that just means we have two values left. So let's just pick some convenient numbers. What are some convenient numbers to work with? Zero. zero. All right. I like zero. So that would tell us that one is equal to a times two times three times three. That's a big number, but that's all right. We'll figure that out. 18a plus b times 3 times 3. But wait a second, I know what b is. b is 1. So that's just plus 9. Plus c times 2 times 2 times 3. So that's 12c. And then d times 2 times 2. Uh, so that's uh, 4 times d, but I know what d is, so that's 1. <coughs> times 4. See, I, you thought I made a mistake. I was being very dramatic. All right, I almost made a mistake. It's good to check your work. Okay, so there's, there's a fact. And if you take 9 4, that's 13. Subtract it across. That tells you that negative 12 equals 18a plus 12c. And if you divide everything by something in common, it looks like 6 is common. Negative 2 equals 3a plus 2 times c. Okay, that's plugging in 0. Uh, another good choice? 1 is good. I think actually negative 1 might be even better here. Because see how we're adding 2 and adding 3? If we choose negative 1, the numbers will be smaller. So let's try negative 1. It doesn't really matter. Whatever number you pick, it will, will work out. So if you plug in negative 1, this would be 1. Then this would be 4. So it would be 4 times a. Here it would be uh, negative 1 plus 3 is 2. Squared, so that's 4 times b, but b is 1, so this is plus 4. Here we'll get 1 times 2. So that's 2 times c. And then on the end, we'll get uh, d times uh, 1. So plus d. But, and, and d we know is 1, so plus 1. So those ones cancel. And so we get, uh, bringing the 4 across, uh, negative 4 equals 4a plus 2c. And now I say, ha ha, ha ha, check it out. Look, they both have two C's in them. Perfect. So we just combine and we'll figure out what C is. So for instance, if I take the top one and I subtract that off the bottom one, the two C's cancel. 4A subtract 3A is A. Negative 4 subtract negative 2 is negative 2. So a is negative 2. And if I know that a is negative 2, now I can just plug it into any one of these. 
negative 4 equals negative 8 plus 2c. Okay, because a is negative 2. Add the 8 across. So we'll get 4 equals 2 times c. So what is c? c is 2. Positive 2. All right. Cool. So are we done? No. If you have a partial fractions problem and you stop here, you'll probably want to get half the points. Because this is a calculus class. We want you to do calculus stuff. All right. So what do you do? Well, what happens now is you say this integral, we now apply the partial fractions. So it's a, which is minus 2 over y plus 2, plus b, which is 1 over y plus 2 squared, plus c, so plus 2 over y plus 3, then uh, plus d, so plus 1 over y plus 3 squared. And now we just integrate each part. So integral of 1 over y plus 2, what would that be? Natural log of y plus 2. And it, you got the negative 2 coming along. Integral of 1 over y plus 2 quantity squared. Yeah, see, so 1 over y plus 2 quantity squared is the same thing as y plus 2 to the negative 2 power. And the plus 2 doesn't really do anything. So you would add 1 to the exponent, negative 1, divide by the exponent, so this becomes minus y over y plus 2. The other terms are similar, plus 2 natural log of y plus 3 and minus 1 over y plus 3. And there we go, except, of course, we want full points, so we make sure to put a plus c. And you're probably thinking, really, there's only 10 points and one of them is going to be a plus c? Maybe. No. Yes, it will, one point. So. Um, is y plus 2 squared at the, in the denominator, does that, like, fraction approach um, infinity at all, just like x to the negative 2 does? Yeah, so essentially, whenever you have, like, the plus 2, it's a, the, you can ignore the plus 2. Because you can do a substitution. z equals y plus 2, then it becomes 1 over z squared. And so it's still z to the minus 2. You don't need to do partial fractions on it, because partial fraction says what? Partial fraction says I can get my terms to look like certain types of pieces, namely some number over a power of a linear term, in which case these are easy to integrate, or some number, that, something that looks like this. If you encountered something that looks like this, what kind of functions are going to come out? You should know how. What kind of functions do you see when you see this time kind of thing when you integrate? So in case people are, I'm, I, I, I want to draw your attention to the ay plus b over y squared plus 2 term. Right, that part. If you saw that and you were to integrate that, what kind of things would you see at the end? One of them rhymes with schmarchmangent. Our tangent, right? That's if you covered up the ay part. You'd have b over y squared plus something. That's an arc tangent thing. Suppose the b was zero and you saw something like ay over y squared plus two. What would you expect to integrate? What would it look like? It would look like a natural log. So be ready to, to handle that. So essentially, you have one of three things happen. You get terms that look like this in which case they're straightforward to integrate, it's just a power rule, or you get terms that look like this, and then it's either a, a natural log of y squared plus whatever, or it's an arc tangent of y over something, or it's a combination of the two. So those are the things that you should see popping out at the end. So, all right. Yes, in the back. Uh, how did you, like, multiply for the uh, partial fractions? Like you have like a times y plus 2 times y plus 3 So how did we get from here to here? Why isn't there like another uh, y plus 2 squared term? Why is there not another y plus 2 squ squared term? Well, so going, so, so you're asking me how to go from these two lines? 
yeah. So the way to think about it is multiply by this piece. y plus 2 squared, y plus 3 squared on both sides. And you say, OK, on the left-hand side, they just say everything cancels, and you're left with the numerator. And then what you do is go through one by one. So here, you get 1y plus 2 to cancel. So you have y plus 2 and y plus 3 squared. Here you get both y plus 2s to cancel, so it's just y plus 3 squared. And you just work your way across. So that's, that's where the things come from. All right. OK, let's have a nice relaxing problem. We need a break. Number 10. Re recall that the error in Simpson's rule for f of x over the interval a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b is bounded above by this expression, m times b minus a to the fifth, 180 n to the fourth. And we would definitely give that to you. We're not going to like hold it back, you know. We want you to know things. Uh, but we want you to know techniques. We don't want you to memorize obscure facts. This is more of an obscure fact. Now, here's the important thing is to understand among these things, the b minus a, no problem. Where do you start and stop? Easy. The n, no problem. The 180, yes, I understand that. It's 180. The m is the hardest part to understand. And once you understand what that is, everything else is easy. So here is the explanation for m. And we'd also give you what m is. So we're not going to just say, oh, where m is some magical number. So m is the maximum of the fourth derivative between a and b. So here's what we know. We know that the error is below that. That's what, what we're being told. And what we want to know is, look, how big could the error be? Worst case scenario. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what these things are. So we have to figure out the four pieces, the b, the a, the n, and the m. Well. Here we go. There's A and there's B. Because we're, we're using Simpson's rule between 0 and pi over 2. So that's A and B. N equals 20 is N. And the reason I knew that that was equal to N is it kind of said it right there. All right. So none of these pieces here, these B, A, and N depend on the function. The function only influences M. So our function is sine of 2x. So what we need to do? Well, we follow the instructions. It tells us the instructions here. It says, take the fourth derivative. All right. So we're going to take some derivatives here. And hopefully we're patient. First derivative, 2 cosine 2x. The second derivative, negative 4 sine of 2x. The third derivative, negative 8 cosine of 2x. The fourth derivative, 16 sine of 2x. All right, so here's our fourth derivative. Now, that's not our answer. I'm just circling it because, I, unfortunately, I was pointing to it, and it just it's a habit of me. All right. I want to understand this, and the question is, what happens between 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to pi over 2? In particular, I want to understand how big can this get? Now. Oftentimes, you just check your endpoints. If you plug in your endpoints, you're going to get 16 sine of 0, which is 0, and 16 sine of pi, which is 0. So you're like, oh, the endpoints are 0, so it's not very big. But it's not saying what happens at the endpoints. It, it often happens that way. You have to say over the whole interval. So let's think about the sine. How big can sine get? It can get as big as 1. So how big can 16 times sine get? 16. And in fact, if you go to the halfway point, plug in pi over 4, you do get up to size 16. <sighs> Something seems amiss here. Zero, one, zero. No, OK, all right, we're fine. <laughs> huh, all right. Uh, well, anyways, 16, all right. So, so the max value which is m is 16. So now we have all our pieces. And so we just put our pieces in. So our error is less than or equal to 16 times b minus a. So that's pi halves minus 0 to the fifth divide by 180 
times 20 to the fourth. Now, if we were doing this problem, what's our next step? Yeah, we circle our answer. Why? Because we read the instructions. It says, you do not need to simplify. Okay, there you go. That's a non-simplified form. So, all right. So error estimation, basically it's follow the formula. Follow the formula. And if you follow the formula, life is good. And if you don't follow the formula, it's not going to be pleasant. All right. The integral from 0 to 2 pi, 64, sine to the 4th x, cosine to the 4th x dx. Now, normally when you see sines and cosines together, your goal is like, ooh, I really hope one of them is an odd power. Are we in that scenario? No, no this is worst case scenario. Okay, so if they're both even, what do you have to do? Power reduction. So know your power reduction formulas. There's three of them. And the three formulas are cosine squared of x is 1 plus cosine 2x divided by 2. Sine squared of x is 1 minus cosine of 2x divided by 2. And the last one is sine times cosine. And this one, I like this one. It's sine of 2x over 2. This is my favorite, because notice there's no plus or minus being introduced. And I like it when plus or minus is not introduced. All right, between the three of these, which one can we use first? Well, we can actually use all of them. But which one would we probably want to use first? Yeah, the sine cosine. Use that one as much as you can. In particular, I notice I have sine to the fourth and cosine to the fourth. I could do the following. In fact, I, I could pull off a, a 2 sine of x, cosine of x, and raise that to the fourth power. Now if I do, that's the sine to the fourth, that's cosine to the fourth. 2 to the fourth is 16. How much is left to give me up to 64? 4. So this would become sine of 2x on the inside. So it's double angle formula, which is, this is double angle formula, just moving the 2 over. So we haven't done any calculus yet. What we've done, though, is we've gone to this point and says, ha-ha, check it out. We have now, instead of having four sines and four cosines, we only have four sines. That's good. What do we do with that? We still keep power reduction because it's still an even power. So 0 to 2 pi. So that'll be 4. And before I do power reduction, I'm just going to write this down. Sine squared of 2x squared. So that's how I'm going to think of sine to the fourth. So this would be a point where I would often make a mistake. So let's find out if I make my mistake here. Sine squared of 2x will be, come in here, 1 minus cosine of, and this is the part, 4x. Yeah, you have to be careful. Because remember, it really just says double whatever is on the inside. So if our inside is already 2x. You've got to double that. So it's going to be 4x. So that's, that's the part that can be tricky. Now here's a, a nice convenient thing, almost as if whoever wrote this problem wanted to anticipate it working out nicely. See we have a 2 squared downstairs? That's like 4, and that cancels off with the 4 there. All right, so let's expand that. So this is the integral 0 to 2 pi. If we multiply that 1 minus cosine 4x squared, that would be 1 minus 2 cosine of 4x plus cosine squared of 4x. Now, do I need to do anything about the 1? No, no, 1's easy. Cosine 4x, are we okay with that? Life is good. Cosine squared of 4x. Power reduction. See, we used that one at the start, then we did our sine squared one. It's like the cosine squared was feeling left out. All right, we'll use u as well. This is the trifecta of problems, right? We get to use all of them. So we got 1 minus 2 cosine of 4x, and then we're going to have plus 1 plus cosine of 8x. Okay, well, hmm, 
Got to start working my way up. All right. Uh, I'm just going to point out you have 1 plus a half, which is 3 halves. So before I integrate, I'm going to put those together. So 3 over 2 minus 2 cosine of 4x plus 1 half cosine of 8x. And we're almost there. Integrate each piece. The integral of 3 halves, 3 halves x. Minus 2 cosine of 4x, antiderivative. It'll be a sine of 4x. It'll, sine won't change. What's the coefficient? It'll be 2 over 4, or become 1 over 2. And the last term will be sine of 8x, and the coefficient? 1 over 16. Because you already have a 1 over 2, and you have to divide by 8 because of the inside. <coughs> and this is a definite integral, 0 to 2 pi. So let's plug in 2 pi. 3 halves times 2 pi would be 3 pi, right? Good. And I hope there's not a lot left. Okay. Sine of 8 pi. 0. Sine of 16 pi. 0. Plug in 0. 0, sine of 0, 0, sine of 0, 0. So, ah, good. There was enough space. 3 pi. And there's our answer. So power reduction. Know your power reduction rules. All right. Number 12. Find the integral du over square root of u times square root of u minus 6 times u minus 3 quantity squared. Oh, th cube. u minus 3 quantity cube. Okay, wow. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Cool. Uh, hmm, what do we do? Partial fractions. Is this a partial fractions problem, and why not? Okay. So I'm going to guess by your reaction it is not a partial fractions problem because... That's not a polynomial. Partial fractions, you have to have a polynomial to apply partial fractions. Don't have a polynomial. Not yet. Hmm. What can we do? Somebody said, combine the square roots. Are you allowed to combine those two square roots? Yes. Now, suppose we had written it like that. It's the same function. Square root of u squared minus 6u. What is that making you think of? It's like trig substitution. It's a square root, and there's something being added or subtracted inside the square root. So it's like, hey, that might be a trig substitution. Somebody else said, it's making me think of completing the square. Aha. They're starting to think streets ahead. Okay, u squared minus 6u. If I want to make this piece be a perfect square, what would I, I need to add? Plus 9, because I take the middle term, divide by 2, and then square it. Now, if I add 9, I have to subtract 9. So this is the same as the square root of u minus 3 squared minus 9. Notice u minus 3 also shows up as u minus 3 there. Coincidence? No. Because otherwise we couldn't do it. All right. So now we see where this problem is going. All right, so I'm just going to rewrite it in our new, slightly fancier form. We have our u minus 3 quantity squared minus 9 times u minus 3 cubed. Trig substitution. What kind of substitution do we make here? It's a secant kind of substitution. So is it u minus 3 equals secant, or do we need anything else? Yeah, 3 secant. And the 3 comes to the fact that this is like our a squared. So 9 would be 3 squared. What does du become? 3 secant tangent. Good. Okay, and the square root of u minus 3 squared minus 9 would become the square root of 9 
secant squared minus 9, or square root of 9 times secant squared minus 1 becomes what? 3 tangent. Yeah, because secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared, take the square roots, and life works out. What a lovely, lovely setup we have. So let's see where this takes us. Upstairs, our du is 3 secant theta tangent theta d theta. Downstairs, we have 3 tangent theta. That's our square root term. And then we have our u minus 3 cubed, which is 3 secant theta cubed. All right, well, we can do a little bit. Uh, hmm. Let's just start being careful. We can cancel the threes. We can cancel the tangent. If we do our next step here, so this is a secant upstairs. Downstairs, if we cube it, so we don't want to lose any of our constants because we want to make sure we get all our points. That's 27 secant cubed. So it looks like we can cancel a, a single secant off. So now we have to integrate something that looks like 1 over secant squared. How do you integrate 1 over secant squared? Ah, 1 over secant squared is cosine squared. Yeah, our trig knowledge. Cool. So this is 1 over 27 cosine squared theta. All right, now we have to figure out what that is. Well, how do you handle cosine squared? Yeah, we just figured out how to do that. So cosine squared is 1 half, and then there is a 1 plus cosine 2 theta. All right, so there's a 1 over 27 and another 1 half, so that's 1 over 54. Integral of 1 is theta. Integral of cosine of 2 theta, well, 1 half sine of 2 theta plus c. Now we need to go back all the way to u. The theta will, will not be so bad. So remember, what do we have? If we, we start with this u minus 3 equals 3 secant theta, this is going to guide our heading back. So what we get is we get that secant of theta is equal to u minus 3 over 3. So that theta is the arc secant of u minus 3 over 3. So that handles the theta. How do you handle sine of 2 theta? <coughs> By what? Well, we can't do a triangle yet. Our triangle, will, there will be a triangle involved. We'll go ahead and draw our triangle. Theta. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. What's our missing side? u squared minus 6u. Now, how do you get that? You take this side squared minus that side squared. But in particular, this should end up being the square root of u squared minus 6u because that was where we started with our trig substitution. And if you didn't get that, you'd be in trouble. Now, we can't apply the triangle yet because the triangle involves theta. We have 2 theta. How do you get rid of the 2 theta? Yeah, double angle. So 1 half sine of 2 theta is code for sine times cosine. Because the 1 half will cancel with the 2. So what do we get? We get 1 over 54 times theta arc secant of u minus 3 over 3 plus, now we come to the triangle. Sine is the opposite over hypotenuse. So the square root u squared minus 6u over u minus 3. Cosine is the adjacent over hypotenuse. So times 3 over u minus 3 and plus c. And that's our answer. Okay. Whew. All right. Well, Starting near the end, we'll hurry through the last two. Integral of e to the t cosine 3t, what technique do you need here? We need to do it by parts. In fact, this one 
is kind of special when you see that e to the t times a cosine or e to the t times sine, do you remember what needs to happen? Do it by parts twice, and then you move stuff around. Okay? Now you might say, would you ever put that on an exam? Yeah, we put that on two out of the three last exams have actually the exact same problem, which boils down to doing this kind of integral. Now, will it be on the next exam? It may or may not, but I'm just letting you know, we have put problems like this on the exams in the past. So, it doesn't matter which part we integrate or which part we differentiate. So, given that I've said that, why do we want to integrate the e to the t? The reason I would strongly suggest you integrate e to the t is because when you take the derivative of the cosine 3t, then you'll be bringing constants out in front instead of bringing them all the way downstairs. And it's much easier to work with things when there's no fractions. All right. So we'll get v equals e to the t, and then we'll get that uh, du, derivative of cosine, is negative 3 sine of 3t. So we get that this is equal to u times v, e to the t, cosine of 3t, minus the integral of v du. Well, so we have minus, there's a, already a minus there, so minus a minus, so this minus will combine with that minus to make this into a plus, 3 sine of 3t, e to the t dt. Now we repeat, and this is the case where you have to be careful. Whatever you chose for your u and your dv, you have to be consistent. So again, e to the t is our dv. The 3 sine of 3t will be our u. v equals e to the t. du is 9 cosine of 3t. So we'll get e to the t cosine of 3t plus, now I don't need any parenthesis because there's a plus and life is good, u times v, so that's uh, e to the t, there's a 3 sine of 3t, okay, there's my u times v term, minus the integral of v du, so that's the integral 9 cosine 3t e to the t dt. And now is our great, aha, whoa, check it out, this integral is suspiciously like the start. Well, of course it is, because it always happens when you have this type of integral. So what we'll do is we're going to take this integral across. Now, notice that this 9, you could really move it out in front. So it's 9 times that integral. So if you do, what do you get? Well, you're going to get 9 of these combines with one of those to produce 10. e to the t cosine of 3t. On the other side, we get e to the t cosine of 3t plus 3 e to the t sine of 3t. Is there anything else we need to put here? Well, we will divide by 10, but there's something else that we need. Plus c. Do you remember where that plus c comes from? These do not necessarily represent the exact same function. They could be off by a constant. So that's where the plus c is coming from that you don't know that they're the same. So you have to say up to some constant they're the same. Finally, we divide both sides by 10. So you get the integral of e to the t cosine of 3t dt is equal to 1 tenth e to the t cosine of 3t plus 3 tenths e to the t sine of 3t. And the c will just stay c, because c is a constant, it can absorb other constants. It absorbs numbers. It's a, it's a number sponge. You multiply it by a number, it just says, okay, and it absorbs that number. You add a number to it, it just, and it absorbs that number. It just keeps absorbing everything. Now, when we put this one on the exam in the last few semesters, I will say it was obfuscated. It was originally like et times cosine squared of 3t. Now, how would you integrate e to the t times cosine squared of 3t? First, use power reduction. Yeah, so, so you got you to gotta look for stuff. You got to look for stuff. If the problem is not in the right form, think about ways to rewrite the problem. Because, uh, well, oftentimes if you rewrite the problem, 
it'll be easier. Which brings us to our last problem. Talking about wanting to rewrite things. Okay, so you have the integral of tangent of theta divided by sine cubed of theta. Now, here's our thing. Sines and cosines mixing together are great. Tangents and secants mixing together are great. Tangent and sine mixing together is not quite right. So, so if you ever are faced with a situation it's like, I don't like these things mixing together, the rule of thumb is write everything in terms of sines and cosines. Okay, so with that rule of thumb in mind, we can say, look, tangent is sine over cosine. So sine over cosine times sine cubed. All right, which makes this integral of sine to the fourth over cosine. Now there's two ways to do this problem and um, we could do both but you probably just want to see one. So one way to work with this problem is to say hey sine to the fourth, you remember how we said at the very start, very first problem, I know it was a long time ago, we said in the very first problem, like an even power of secant looks a lot like an even power of tangent. The same is true for sines and cosines, an even power of sine looks a lot like an even power of cosine. So let's do that. I don't think that's going to be faster, Steve. Hmm. All right. Anyways, we'll do it, and we'll just see where we end up. Right? What's the worst case scenario? It just takes us longer. Okay. So, worst case scenario, I can think of, let's do <coughs> sine squared theta times 1 minus cosine squared theta. So I'm going to take one of my sine squares and replace it by 1 minus cosine squared. I can replace them both. Well, let's just start with 1 and see where that gets us. So if we do it with 1, what do we get? Well... I'm going to multiply through and then clean it up. So we'll get sine squared of theta over cosine of theta minus sine squared of theta. But now you have a cosine squared over a cosine, which becomes cosine. Let's talk about these two. In essence, sine squared over cosine is better than sine of the fourth over cosine. How do we feel about sine squared over cos times cosine? Are we comfortable with that one? Yeah. Yes, we like that one. That's great. Why? Because we see sine to an even power times a single cosine. So when you have a sort of like one that's separate, you can do a substitution. So this is right for substitution. If you set u equals sine theta, du is cosine theta d theta, which means that you get a minus u squared du. And that means easy to integrate, life is good. So when you have a single cosine like that, life is good. Sine squared over cosine theta, hmm, not so clear. Well, what can we do with sine squared? Well, sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared. It's a true story, true story. And then you still have the other stuff on the end. All right, so, but now divide the, the cosine through. 1 over cosine, secant, minus cosine squared over cosine. So that'll become a single cosine, minus cosine. Then minus sine squared cosine. Now, how do we feel about this? We already said the last one we can do by substitution. The middle term, cosine, can we integrate that? Yes. Secant, can we integrate that? Yes. So, we can write down our answer. Integral of secant. Natural log secant plus tangent. And you're probably wondering, how do I know that? The answer is you memorize it. Do it. Memorize it. All right. Integral of cosine? Sine. So minus sine. Okay, did you see what this one's going to turn into? Integral of sine squared times cosine? This one is, you can probably do this in your head by now. It's like u squared du. 
So it's like one third u cubed, where u is sine. And plus c. Are there other ways to do this? Absolutely. Now, I will warn you that the trig problem, and I don't have to be coy about it, because there is a problem that involves trigonometry, because every technique is being tested, remember? The trig problem, don't panic. Just don't force anything. Look and think about the simplest way to rewrite. Try a little bit. If it's getting complicated, if anything on this exam is getting complicated, something has gone wrong because the answers are all fairly simple and straightforward. So don't complicate things. Look to way, make things simple. All right. Sorry to take so long. Good luck on the exam.